Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Temple of the Exploding Head Omnibus, Part 1, Chapter 4, Forging His Karg. So last week, Kay, as he's about to step off the 4,000-foot-high balcony and plunge to his death, is distracted by his mother, Countess Sigillus. She has no idea that he's planning on jumping off a balcony. She knows, though, that he's been suffering under the weight of the things that are expected of him, and he's got issues with his gifts, and he can't see, and he can't do all their things, and she knows that's bothering him. So she decided to distract him and give him a, a task to visit Countess Fercandia, who is an ancient Blanchford Countess during the days when the Hightath and the Vith were at odds. And that was a long time ago, and it was a pretty long, pretty brutal period in the history of Cana. But Countess Fercandia fought at her lord's side. She used a karg, a little one, a small one. That's something that she could use. And Kay saw the karg and the only karg he's ever really seen is his father's king karg which is huge and very heavy over 70 pounds and he can't budge at this point but he sees this little one and he goes hey you know that's a good idea maybe i hadn't thought of that maybe i could do something like that and then he starts speaking to the the statue of countess for candy it's not the, the countess it is as we know I hope it's clear from the previous chapters that that is Sam's voice. And she introduces herself as Lady Sammy Doran. And she's, Kay can't see her. She's just a, a voice that he's talking to that seems to be coming right out of the statue. As I mentioned before, the reasoning that Sam is just a voice in this case, and we can, from what we've read in the previous chapters, that monomas have a lot of powerful abilities that... This is just a monoma ability that she's using that is a feature of her people, and it is. But in the original draft, Sam being just a voice in this chapel had nothing to do with monomas and superpowers. It had a lot to do with the arcane, and it had a lot to do with evil spirits. Once we get to that part of the book, I'll reveal what it is. Because when you're writing something a piece of fiction when you're doing any creative pursuit you can't become caught up in what you're doing you know you're you're sitting there and you're just creating heaven you're just creating this and that it's great you got a warm fuzzy and you're all bundled up and you got your hot cocoa or whatever your drink of choice might be and it's just awesome but you have to be able to scrutinize your own work from a helicopter point of view, looking down on your work, and you, and you have to ask yourself this question, you're enjoying this, is anybody else going to? And even though I really liked how the story was progressing, I had to admit that it was just too convoluted, it was just too messy for not enough payoff for why things were proceeding as they were. And I had to adjust and I had to change the reasoning why Sam was a voice. And then in that readjustment period, that's when the elements that made their way to the final draft, the monomas, the pale skin, the black eyes, the superpowers, the long fingernails, that's what Sam became in time. She, that's not what she was originally. And you'll see once we get to that point. But so I had to basically not simplify the story, just send it in a more fruitful direction, one that would pay off better than what I was doing. And you have to be able to do that. You have to sometimes take something that you really like and just clip it to the floor. It's just part of the writing process, part of the creative process, where things that you love go away. But any event, so. Kay meets Sam in the chapel, and after a while, they develop a bit of a rapport, and Kay promises to read Sam the Daily Post, which she really enjoys but doesn't receive in her home, wherever that is, because she didn't tell him. And that takes Kay's mind off of his suicidal thoughts 
And he vows he's going to keep his promise to Sam to read her the post. So here we are, part one, chapter four, forging his card. Let's see how this relationship develops. And we'll meet uh, another character that's going to be going forward. And I'll mention that at the end. But so here we go. This is Temple of the Exploding Head Omnibus, book one, The Dead Held Hands. Part one, Kay and Sam, chapter four, forging his card. Kay didn't kill himself that day, or the next, or any day after that. In fact, he forgot all about it. True to his promise, he returned to the hidden chapel and read Sam the posts with a tiny portable terminal. Nearly every day he went there. Sam wasn't a passive listener. She liked to ask frequent questions, and even enjoyed forcefully sharing her opinion on things, even if she didn't really know what she was talking about. Sometimes they argued over the post. Kay began considering Sam a close friend, someone with whom he could share his deepest secrets. And she loved to flirt. She loved to tell him how cute she thought he was, and every so often he'd feel a warm kiss on his cheek. Show yourself, Sam, Kay often said, but Sam refused. She said she wasn't allowed. True to her word, she helped him lift the run vanyan mostly through encouragement though she also taught him a few simple techniques for clearing his mind and focusing properly he would sit on the floor in the chapel cross-legged and in the dark he could sense sam sitting right next to him in a similar manner before the winter was out he was able to lift the run vanyan off its stand though the effort took everything he had let alone trying to use it to fight with he could now lift it and he should by rights inherit his father's king card but what good would that do he couldn't possibly fight with it he couldn't even lift it up to level to that end sam had a much better idea you should forge your own card is there any rule against that? No, but my father was hoping to pass his card down to me so that I'd carry it with me as, as he's done through the years. Well, you're not your father and he's not you. Did he ever forge his own card? No, I don't think so. He just uses my grandfather's. The king card was created by my grandfather back in the day. Just think how proud he'd be if you walked up to him one day and said, Look, Father, I, I made this with my own two hands, and it'll serve me and the house well for years to come. I think he'd really be impressed. Kay thought about it. It seemed to make sense. You really think so? I do. Kay was bursting with excitement and ideas. Well, all right, let's do it. But wait... Wait, one second here. I, I don't know the first thing about making a karg. Well, let's start with the basics. What is a karg? It's the traditional weapon of our house, designed to fight the high tath, the giants of old. It's a tubular shaft with a hilt, usually straight, and anywhere from three to eight feet long, the shaft being adjustable in length. Is it a club? No. You use it like a sword, sort of. It cuts like a sword, with the two being micro-faceted to cut. There are drums, I think, in the old smithy by the lake that machine in the correct grooves and facets that allow it to work. He approached the statue of Countess Vercandia and pointed at her karg. 
something like hers. Something small and fairly light, though I, I don't like her hilt. My father's karg has an X-shaped hilt, with each arm of the X being dedicated to a different season. I should have a similar X-shaped hilt for my karg as a tribute to his. That's a great idea. I think he'd like that. Kay was buzzing with ideas. I'm going to get some books on the various kinds of metals to use, and I'm going to have to draft a design of, of some sort. Can I do that, Kay? I'm pretty good at drawing and inscribing things. I, I mean, it won't have any technical details, but I'd like to contribute something, if I could. Well, sure. Sam, sure. Kay left the chapel and got out as many books as he could find on the subject of bladesmithing, including several arcane Blanchford texts on the subject of carg making, which was quite a bit different. He read all about drop forging and casting and creating the machining for the various links that would compose the Kark's expandable shaft. Look at all the math! Equations for calculating correct diameter and circumference, equations for determining the center of balance, metal thickness, link weighting, and on and on. It was rather overwhelming. His cousin Philip was quite good with math, and Kay sent him several hollows asking for help. Philip responded and got him started. Philip was curious on what Kay was doing, and he replied, It's a surprise. See you in a few months. Philip must have told Sarah as she'd sent Kay a basket full of mail, demanding to know what he was doing. She even requested that he stop whatever it was he, he was up to and wait for them to return in April. Then they could help him. Mm, sorry, Sarah. Thanks for the offer. But he wanted to do this alone. The next morning, he awoke to find a packet of papers lying in his bed. It was a draft design for a karg, hand-drawn but laid out with incredible skill and detail. A professional draftsman couldn't have done better. There was a note attached to it. What do you think? S. There it was, a beautiful facsimile of Countess Fercandia's karg. The hilt was X-shaped, like his father's with some exquisite design work decorating each arm. Sam had done a wonderful job. She was a true artist. It was Tuesday, and that meant it was time to go down with Lady Kylos and be reviewed by the great lords and ladies. He normally dreaded those days, but today he stood like a statue without a care as his mind was elsewhere, turning on his karg. People came by, and he rarely noticed or heard what they said. At some point during the afternoon, a smallish man with a round belly and a garish plumed hat came up. He smiled and stood there for a while. And he whispered in Kay's ear, Well, hello, Kay. Well met. I am Milos, Lord of Probert, a good friend of the family. I designed that ship your father flies around in. I've known your father since I was just a boy about your age. What a fine son Davin Sig have. I have a son who's about your age as well. His name is Lon. I brought him today and hope you two might become friends. Keep the tradition going. After the review had concluded, Davidge and Sigillus led Kay into a ground floor reading room. Sitting within was a small round boy wearing a long coat, knee breeches, and buckle shoes. He'd pulled down a few books and was reading them, two at a time. The remains of a bowl of ice cream sat in front of him. That must be that lawn kid Lord Probert had mentioned. The door closed, and Kay and Lon were stuck in there. There was a lot of silence as the two boys gawked at each other. Eventually, Kay, feeling rather uncomfortable, found a few books himself and decided to take advantage of the time to continue designing his karg. The two boys sitting opposite at the table and saying nothing. He pulled Sam's drawing from his coat pocket and began trying to calculate the various lengths of the pieces using Philip's equations as a guide. He'd written out several pages of notes when, Are you working on something? There was Lon sitting there on the other side of the table trying to see what he was doing. He was clearly quite curious. A touch of chocolate stained his lips. Just a project. Oh, 
Lon stared at him. Is your hair purple? Yes. What of it? Nothing? Just asking. More silence. Lon's stomach rumbled. C can I see? Why? Just curious. My father's a great engineer. I'm going to be an engineer too. Or maybe a scientist. My mother's a great scientist. It's a secret project. Lon seemed impressed. Oh, well, I'm great at keeping secrets. My mother shared all sorts of secrets with me, and I've never told a soul. Not even the sisters can stare them out of me. Really? Kay sized the tiny Lon up. What if I came over there and beat them out of you? What then? Oh, well, I wouldn't like that much. But you'd still not get anything of use out of me. I, I, I'm sure I'd say something during the beating. But you never know if I was secret telling or not. I've memorized volumes of convincing sounding fake secrets. Kay thought about it and laughed. And then showed Lon his drawings. Lon looked them over. Oh, you're, you're designing a weapon. I am. Very interesting. The most important thing is your center of balance. He came over to Kay's side of the table and pointed at the design. You see, th this length here is too long. Your equation isn't quite correct, I think. It'll be top-heavy how you've got it here. There are a few changes we can apply to this to right the balance. Here! And soon... Kay of Blanchford and Lon of Probert were sitting side by side with their coats off, poring over the details. Trays of snacks were sent into the room as they worked. They started the day uncomfortable strangers and ended it great friends. A month later, Kay was nearly ready. He stood in the old smithy where his ancestors used to smelt bullets and other such things. It had fallen into disuse after the Blanchfords switched from arms making to fabric making as the family trade. The last thing forged there many years ago was, oddly enough, the King Karg. The kettle high overhead was bubbling with molten metal, kept hot by the ceramic furnace spewing steam and heat. His father, seeing the plume of smoke coming from the smithy, had wanted to know what was going on. Thinking fast, Kay mentioned he was creating a cast statue of Mother to present to her on her birthday. Davidge was excited about the idea and happy with Kay's initiative. To keep from making himself into a liar, Kay also was going to pour a statue of his mother, Sigillus. Once again, Sam, proving herself a wonderful artist, created the drawings of it. Davidge came out every so often to see how he was progressing, and Kay showed him the drawings. He was pleased. Standing before Kay was a vat of wet silica sand 30 feet wide and 10 feet deep. Resting inside the wet sand was a form of his karg, along with four pieces of what would become his mother's statue. The forms were made of spring cyst, a polymer that would be evaporated by the molten metal. When the metal was poured in, it would destroy the spring cyst and occupy the space in the sand, assuming the precise shape of the karg and his mother's statue pieces. With the help of the staff, Kay had made several mock-ups of the karg and the statue pieces, starting with clay and finishing with a fired ceramic. He then gave the mock-ups to Lon, who, using his father's resources, had them scanned and recreated as the spring cyst blanks. Originally, Kay had planned on making a karg the way his grandfather had, with billets of hammered metal creating each link and then machining them into a shaft. To that end, he'd required a raw consignment of carbon steel, titanium, vandium, aluminum, molybdenum, tungsten, antimony, gold, and lead. The steel was mostly for the statue pieces, but all of that changed when his mother Sigillus came down to see what he was doing. He decided to share with her his plans and showed her all he'd done, with the exception of the statue. Well, this is wonderful, Kay. Truly, I'm so amazed by what you've done. The drawings, the medals, I'm so proud. 
I'd like to contribute something, if I may. And Sigillus filled a kettle full of glowing silver tech straight from her hands. Heat this for a month, Kay. Keep it hot and add the other metals and you'll be amazed by the results. You won't need to create links. Just pour it into the form. Trust me. She kissed him and left. After a month of keeping the silver tech molten hot and adding the other metals, the smithy masters from the village poured the concoction into the sand, down the shaft and into the form of his carg, the noise and smoke terrific as they did so. The form didn't fill up and burst out in a fan of sparks like he thought it would. Instead, the masters drained the kettle and then opened the gate, admitting the waters of the bloodstein run into the vat. A clamor of steam escaped as the metal was quenched. They then reset the vat and repeated the process with the steel for his mother's statue. After it had cooled, there it was, his carg, perfectly formed with the infusion of silver tech. It did some amazing things that were readily apparent. It glowed just like Lieutenant Kylos's tweeter bird did, making a soft whitish light. It was also lighter than anything, not 10 pounds, and it could change its size longer and shorter as needed without having to manually adjust it. All we had to do was want it to change, and it did. Running outside, he found a tree and swung, hoping to chop it in two. Whack! The karg shook the tree and vibrated out of his hand. It took great skill to use the karg in a cutting manner, a skill he didn't currently possess. What's this? Davidge said as Kay entered his study. Davidge was sitting behind his desk. He was wearing his usual fleet coat and frilly shirt, exactly what Lieutenant Kylos always wore. His blue hair appeared black in the quiet light of the study. Kay came in, got on one knee, and held out his karg. I made this, father. He put down his pen and stood, taking the karg from Kay's hands, turning it over, inspecting it. Kay? You made this? Yes, father. All on your own, with no help? Oh, I, I had lots of help. Philip and Lon helped me work out the math. And I had help with the design, and mother contributed silver tech to its making. Why well, see that? Creation, wh what a thing. Look at it, so light. Balance perfect. Davids tried to bend the shaft. Strong, too. The general shape reminds me of Windermere, Countess for Candia's carg of long ago. Kay nodded. I, I used Windermere as a starting point. I, I can lift the Runvanian now, Father, but it's so heavy. I don't think I'll ever be much use with it. I thought a smaller, lighter weapon would serve me better. I, I hope you're not disappointed. Disappointed? Davidge gasped. Look at this. Look what you've done here. What about your mother's statue you told me about? Was that just a cover to prevent me from discovering what you were doing? Yes, Father, although I didn't want to disappoint you or lie to you, and I, I created a statue of Mother as well, cast in four pieces. It's not completed yet. It needs to be welded and finished. Davidge, gazing at the car, pushed his hat back and smiled ear to ear. God's bodkins! See, this is what those lords and ladies miss in review. That there's a heart in there, a character, and a soul to match. This is what it means to be a Vith, Kay. Not your hair color, or how tall you are, or the shade of your eyes. It's how you overcome an obstacle. And it's keeping the promises that you make, even those made in passing. I'm not dismissing your accomplishment with your card here. But I think keeping the statue part of your promise... Shows just what sort of man you're going to become. And I'm very proud of you. Davidge looked at the karg in his hands. Look at this. Look what my son has done. He said over and over. I'd like your mother's statue completed and ready to present to her by her birthday. I think I know a wonderful spot in the grove where we can place it. Do you need help? No, father. Savage gave the karg back to Kay and unsaddled his king karg, a giant in comparison. Well now, Kay, you have your weapon, and a fine one it is. Now it's time you learned how to use it. Are you ready to begin your training? There is much to learn. I am, father. And with that, we conclude 
part one, chapter four, forging his card. This chapter went through a lot of revisions because in the, in the original draft, even after the book had been published, Kay didn't really have help from anybody. He just did this all by himself, and it, it just it dawned on me that's not. There's no way that Kay, just a kid, could do all this stuff. I was like, he's gonna need help. He's gonna need help with the math. He's going to need the help gathering the materials. He's going to need help forging this thing because he doesn't know what he's doing. So I wrote in and then recreated a second version of the book for publishment that, where he gets the help from the, the villagers and from his, his cousin and from Lon. Lord Lon of Probert. This is how Kay and Lon meet. Like his father, Milos Probert mentioned, he has been a, a friend of Captain Davidge's for a long time. He is the lead ship designer for the fleet. He designed the, the stray lights, you know, the seeker that Captain Davidge used to fly in. And he designed the Triumph class of ships, the one that Captain Davidge is currently using. He, in book two had a persistent rival in the science ministry who was like butting in on his ship designing things where the lady Branna of the house of Pitcock was wanting to get in on ship building as kind of stepping on Lord Milos's feet. They didn't like each other much and he threatened to have her thrown in prison for crimes against the league and she threatened to have him thrown in her dungeon with all the lice and fleas and rats uh they didn't seem to like each other much but they were kindred spirits in intellect in in different branches of engineering and the sciences lady branna very uh formidable lady and then in book two her husband died and Lady Branna was all of a sudden available. And Lord Milos had been in love with Lady Poe of Blanchford, Captain Davidge's sister. And Poe loved Milos in return, but not in a romantic way, as a, as a brother, as a, a friend, basically. She cherished Milos of Prober, but she didn't have any romantic feelings for him. And he had to come to terms with that and eventually he and his rival lady branna fell into each other's arms and married making a very formidable couple they had several children and one of whom was lon of probert and he initially had just a really small role in this story going forward but my my departed sister she really liked lon and she was always asking me you know if, are you gonna add him more into the book and i was like no and she's like you gotta add lon in and finally i was like fine i added more of lon and, and i'm glad i did he's a, he's a fun character he's a good character lon of probert you'll be seeing a lot more of him down the road k designs his carg with the help of Lon and many others. And his mother, Sigillus, adds silver tech into it, which gives it a lot of arcane mystical powers. So it's not just a, uh, a weapon that you can adjust in size. It's, it, it changes its size by itself. It glows. And it can do other things that we'll find out later. It's very light, very strong. And now Captain Davidge is going to teach K how to properly use a card because you can't just swing it around and expect it to do anything other than bludgeon your victim to death to use it like a sword takes a, a lot of training so captain davidge is going to get right to that sam assisted in its design sam is among other things very skilled with her hands as she's a, a, a very good artist and not a draftsman but she can make things that look pretty well drafted and she designed the basic look of Kay's karg. So now Kay has his karg. Much smaller, much lighter, very arcane in nature. That karg will be with him for a lot of adventures that we will see going forward. Next week, part one, chapter five, five questions. We'll see as Kay and Sam's relationship develops He's getting sick and tired of her being a, an amorphous voice in a chapel. He wants to know. He knows nothing about her other than her name. And that's about it. 
She hasn't really developed or divulged anything. So next week, part one, chapter five, five questions. Kay is going to start pressing Sam for some info. And we'll see how that develops going forward. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.